Here's Danny Woodhead and Matt Slauson back on Kaplan and Crew. Danny, Matt, good to see you guys. Hey, hey guys, I appreciate you help, helping us on. Um, uh, you know, our times out there in San Diego were were awesome, and seems like the char- Chargers are back to their same old ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us, guys. Thanks for having us. <laughs> uh, well, hey, uh, Matt, you say back to their same old ways. You know, today in the L.A. Times, they're actually being ridiculed for having beaten the Atlanta Falcons yesterday. The writer says in the L.A. Times, the only thing that's saving the Chargers from being the laughing stock of the L.A. sports scene is that there's no fans in the stands. Could you imagine what it would have been like at the end of the first half when it's third and one with 22 seconds, you've got no timeouts, and you run the ball and can't get your field goal unit onto the field? They would have gotten booed off the field. Oh, Oh my gosh. Well, I find it hilarious that uh, Anthony Lynn said he was going to take over play calling du- duties and the, uh, our uh, special, special team, team. Play, special teams play calling duties. And then he messes it all up <laughs> and, and then they get, get penalized for too many men on the field. It's like, that's the, the, the that is the most basic thing in the world to just say like, all right, we're going to kick kicking team. Go on. You know, it's it's funny. We talk about. I I loved my time in San Diego. It's probably the best four years of my career. I loved it. Have I mean, obviously, I knew Matt before that, but some of the teammates that I, um, you know, had there, had the, there, the, the teammates, the teammates that I, that I probably communicate with the most now, and in in the people that I really enjoyed. But it's almost, and I mean, when you play in it, it sucks. You deal with some, like, it felt like sometimes bad stuff would happen. But, like, this is on a new level, right? I mean, I mean, we can even look back to the Buffalo game. What happened, and they ran the ball and lost how much time to where it's impossible to win the game. Um, not that they were going to. I mean, you still have to get the onside kick, which is practically impossible anymore. But that just can't happen and it continues to happen and unfortunately in that organization now i i didn't play for the la chargers i played for the san diego chargers so it's a different team you know as as far as i as far as i can say it but uh yeah it's a man that's just that's tough to deal with and and that can't happen that's something that's coached and coached and coached and coached like you got to know that there's a there's a thing that they call hurricane uh, depending on the place but hurricane is hurricane field goal kick that means you better get on the field so like if it is a third and two a third and one you don't get it the field goal team has to be running on ready to go and the offense has to know hey we didn't get the first down we got to get off the field so it's something that's practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced like that's called situational football like that's very important Danny, let me let me ask you this because you came to the San Diego Chargers from the New England Patriots. Right. We we all look at the New England Patriots, even with what's happening to them this year, and we look at Belichick and we say, that's the most prepared football team in the NFL, week mm-hmm. in and week out. So I agree with you. The coaching staff is coached. Hey guys, it's gonna be third and two, 22 seconds to go, balls on the 12 yard line, no timeouts. What's the plan? Plan is, coach, we're gonna throw the ball on third down, hopefully into the end zone for a touchdown. If not, maybe we get a PI. If not, maybe we get an incomplete pass. Either way, we'll get the field goal unit on next. You would never run the football. It makes no sense. So, in your opinion, having been in the Belichick staff, yeah, and in the San Diego Charger organization, and now being an outside observer. What do you what do you think that goes on that they don't, that have, they don't have in, in place? In place. I mean, the thing is, I, I can't imagine that play call ever being called. I mean, there's certain plays that you can call, even like a throw, that you catch it, get down, spike the ball. Like that's there's plays that um you can call that you do that, and that's what teams work on. I haven't heard of a run. Like that's good. That's a little confusing to me. Um, and that's why I'm like, I wasn't watching the game at the time. Our producer actually texted us. I'm like, wait, what, what just happened? And I was like, Oh my gosh. Like how on earth does that type of crap happen ever? I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, no, that's not, this I think is, is why Danny and I kind of give, give the chargers organization a hard time. 
Uh, and when I say Danny and I, 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 I mean me. Mainly Matt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we, we both were fortunate enough to play for other organizations, play for, for or organizations that are very, uh, you know, quality, well-run, uh, every decision made is in the light of, you know, winning. Uh, and Dan Danny being at the pinnacle of that in New England there, we, we all got to see what that feels like. And, uh, and it's a dramatic difference being part of the char char Chargers or organization. And, you know, we, we, we just feel for, you, you know, our brothers on the team, the guys that we care a lot about that don't know any different there. Uh, I just I mean, Philip was one of them, and now he's yeah. seeing the other side. Yeah, now and now he's getting to play for one of the most quality or organizations with uh, uh, you know a GM that has full full decision making power and is and is making every decision to win. Wait, so and, Matt, you, yeah. so Matt, so so it's very interesting because Danny, I always remember you and Philip being close and Matt, you just said something super interesting about a general manager having full control of decision-making abilities. So in the charger organization, Tom Telesco has been there a long time. There are some draft choices you would say are good and others that have been major failures, but it, but does he have control? Danny, you've got, hey, Danny, yeah, you're let, jumping let, in. You're let ready. Me, let, let me say something about this because I went there in 2003, 13, I think it was. Yeah, my last was 12 in New England. And Mike McCoy that first year <clears throat> had all control. Like he – did we – were did we overachieve? I don't know that year. I don't think so. But, like, we figured it out. And we got to 9-7, and seven, got in the playoffs, won a playoff game in Cincy, and then ended up losing to the Broncos. That's when they had Peyton Manning. And – that was seen that first year, you could tell Mike had his fingerprint on the team. And it's kind of crazy because everyone wants to say, oh, Mike McCoy this, Mike McCoy that. I was there the last three years too. I was there all four years with Mike. And it was almost like he wasn't allowed to have his fingerprint on. It was like less and less each year. So, like, so, then, so then who got more and more? I'm not saying who it was because I personally don't know. But I know it wasn't the assistant coaches under him. You know, I mean, Matt, Matt you must know. Come on, Matt. yeah, go ahead. You must know. Uh, I've I've got no self self control, so I'll just throw it out there. Uh, when I got there, and uh, uh, you know, they put me in a leadership role and and said that they they needed things uh, to change change on the O line. Uh, they kind of gave me the reins to do so, and really, everybody on the offensive line did uh, the same. The same thing, and uh, we had one one particular player on the line that I didn't think was re ready to play. Who? <laughs> All right, that that I will not do. I'm not going to throw <laughs> throw one of my teammates under the bus. But uh, respect, respect, respect. Um, but uh, there was a couple other guys that were far and away better than this particular player, and I went to Mike. I said, "We got to make a change." This is not good for, for our, our O-line if we go with this guy. And if we go with option A, B, or C over here, we're a better line. And Phil will be better, and our team will be better for it. And he said, Matt, I can't do it. My hands are tied. That decision comes from above me. I was like, oh, okay, well, you're, you're the one that's going to get fired for this. And it the sucks because – and when John Spanos took over, that happened when Danny was there, when he got promoted to whatever position he has now, which I'm sure he had the, that power before he got the position. That happened when you were there, Danny. So do you think yeah. it, I don't it's know. clearly a correlation? I, yeah, I don't know if it's John. I mean, you see, you, I, I got do. along great with John. <laughs> I got along great with John, Tom, everyone you know, within the organization, but there's a problem in a lot of teams, right? And that's the people upstairs – trying to decide who plays. When does that, when has that ever worked? I'm going to answer this for you. Never. It's never worked. There's a lot of teams that still do it. And it's like the GM and the front office and the player personnel, all those people, you guys do the work that you got to do to get the people. You know, I'm saying as far as the draft, the free agencies or the free agents, all that crap. You guys do that but don't you ever try to coach a team 
Because when you try to coach a team, what happens? You lose. You always lose. A lot of teams, that, that's what it happens. That's what happens. I'd rather have uh, the, the John Lynch, Kyle, Kyle Shanahan relationship if you're going to do a GM coach or if you're going to do it, which it doesn't work very often, but like with Bill Belichick, he runs everything. He has a, you know, a high up player personnel dude that's kind of like the GM, the acting GM, but every decision goes through Bill. Well, why, why are we like messing, messing with this whole, hey, well, we drafted him. He's got to play. No, you're going to lose respect from the, every single veteran on your team. And every team has at least a few veterans. But I'll give you, so, I'll give you one answer, though. The, the one answer for why would the front office force playing time for a certain player, and Matt, maybe you'll agree with this, because the Spanos family, everything they do is about dollars. It's not about wins. And so if they're going to pay somebody, Matt, I'll just assume that in your equation, whoever it was that they were, that was playing – was probably either a, a high draft choice or a high price free agent player because they the the guess would be well we paid him therefore he must perform yeah but i got three guys over here that are better it doesn't matter he's the guy being paid so i mean matt i would put a lot of that i, I would say that john spanos is in control and tom telesco's got a really nice high paying job just to take the darts that are thrown so that they never get thrown at john what do you say yeah but the problem with that is is that when things don't go well then the head coach is on the chopping block and the GM's on the chopping block. John Spanos is never going to be on the chopping block. So until him and, you know, Jerry Jones finally realize I need to step out of the way. And by the way, I'm not putting John Spanos in the same realm as Jerry Jones. Uh, to, to me, Jerry Jones adds, adds to the game. Uh, but, he, but even him, he needs to step out of the way and let his coach and GM do what they're there to do. Uh, but this isn't like, <laughs> like this isn't the only team. Like we, we talked so, about this on our pod. There's like seven teams that are trying to win the Super Bowl every year. Maybe not even seven. So if the question is the GMs or the upfront office people getting in the way of the people who are actually running game plans and deciding games on the field, is it more respectable if your GM is more of the John Lynch style, a guy who has played, a guy who has credentials, a guy who has stripes? that you respect his opinion more or is it more that you need a guy who can actually produce winners on the field? I think it's stay out of the way. Like you do your uh, job because coaches, if, if coaches aren't drafting people, if it's, if it's general managers or front office people, if they're drafting people, if you, if you look at like under the description of a general manager or under a director of player personnel, pro play personnel, it's to, it's to do that crap. It's never, ever once been to, be the head coach. It's never been to be an assistant coach. John Lynch, he knows, he understands the business. He understands, all right, I'm, I'm going to do everything in my power to give Kyle Shanahan the players to play. And then that's Kyle Shanahan's job to play the players. Like that's, that's his job. Is, it's, it's not to, Kyle Shanahan's job is not to draft people. And John Lynch's job is never to coach unless he so, wants to. How much of this is on the guy, though? Because, Matt, you just talked about a guy who was on the line who didn't belong on the line. You had somebody behind him better. How much of this is on the players to just actually perform? Oh, yeah, that's, that's a huge part of it, too. Uh, you know, as a player, we're essentially mer mercenaries. We're brought there to do a job, and if we don't do our job, then, then we don't have a job anymore. So, yes, it's, all, it's definitely on the player to do his job and perform. But if he's not well enough equipped to do his job, that, that's not on the player anymore. And think about that's this. Just, just he can't do it. Football's 11 players on the field, right? You want to put your best 11 on the field. Well, what if you have eight out of 11? And then you have like, I don't know, 23, 24, and 25 on that 11 too? You're just not going to be as successful. But just, Isn't just, this, and it's like human it nature happen. too, right? So like Matt, you said you, you went to McCoy and you said, we got to make this change on the O-line. He's like, it's not up to me. I can't do it. Like it's human nature to automatically almost be like defeated a little bit to be like, well, what am I supposed to do here? Like we know we can be better, but you're not letting us be better too. Well, yeah, there, there was some of that, but 
but I'm still a pro, you know, I'm going to go out there and do my job to the best, best of my ability. And I was brought there to lead, uh, to lead, lead that room, lead, lead the guys, help fill, lead the offense. Um, so I, I mean, my job is never going to change now. It's, do I it's look not going to affect you. Situation? Do I look at that situation and go, well, that sucks. I mean, <laughs> does that mean we have a shot to win anymore? There, there's a small part of me in that, but, uh, but, but yeah, I'm going to go out and just do I'm going to answer it. Remote. I'm going to answer it for you. It doesn't change the way you play, and your performance is going to be the same exact. But an offensive line as a whole, if you want to be, I don't know, if we're going to go off a grade system, an A offensive line, well, if you're not playing your best players, it's going to be a B or a C. Well, that that's so that the performance is going to change. It's not going to change Matt Slauson's performance, but it's going to change the offensive lines. Oh, it's going to change the running games. Oh, it's going to change Philip getting hit performance. So that it's like a trickle down effect. It's so amazing though to listen to you guys. We're talking to Danny Woodhead and Matt Slauson, both former San Diego Chargers. They've got a podcast called Out of Nowhere Podcast. I want to ask you guys this question. So. I remember when LaDainian Tomlinson left and went to the Jets, and I remember interviewing LT and saying, so you know, what, how would you compare the two organizations? And he was like, oh, God, are you kidding me? The Jets, it's first class all the way. You know, and the Chargers, it's kind of like, uh, I didn't realize how bad it was until I went to the Jets. Do you guys think Phillip Rivers is finding that out now, that, that the Colts are a different kind of organization, they do things better, and they spare no expense, et cetera? I mean, my, what do you guys think? My guess is when he signed, he was like, holy crap. Because we have been in both, I mean, both scenarios. I was at the Patriots, probably the, arguably the greatest organization, or at least during this time frame, this era. And were there things that annoyed me about New England? Sure. First of all, there's going to be things that annoy me about anywhere. Nothing's ever perfect. But I will say, when I first got to San Diego, I was like, oh, I, I, I kind of like this house a little more relaxed. And Mike came in, and he was still, like, that first year, he was able to put his – like his fingerprint on it. And you're like, okay, I, I think we're, and then things kind of just he, like Slaw said, was kind of out of his power. If he can't keep his fingerprint on it and keep people accountable, like he wanted to, well, you're just going to, you're not going to be as effective. You're not going to be consistent. You're not going to be, the players aren't as accountable. Like that makes things difficult to win. It makes it. So I got to the end of my four years and I, like I said, greatest four, I loved it. It was, it was an amazing time in my life. Um, but it was almost like I was craving to get back in an organization that you felt like was literally trying to win the Super Bowl. Now, I, like I said, I have great relationships with even the front office people. This but people. if we're going off of street, street business, business in football, it's different. Wow. Talking to Danny Woodhead and Matt Slauson this afternoon. Let me ask you guys a question. Um, do you guys have a little bit more time or are you guys up against the clock here this afternoon? I have, I'm good. No, no, I, I, I'm all good. I, I just got my little girl with me today. The boys, boys are in school. My wife, wife is gone. So I'm on dad, dad time. So you may see her pop, pop in and out here a little, little bit. I completely understand. I've got school going on outside here too. Cause, <laughs> cause unlike with you guys, you guys are both in Iowa. Is that right? No, Nebraska. Oh, excuse me, Nebraska. Greatest, sta greatest state on earth. Matt, are you in Iowa? Yeah, okay. Nebraska. Yeah. Hey, oh, you really? make it here. You make it here, you'd be like, oh, my goodness, it is a little bit cold, but I'm moving here. That's what you would say. So don't come here unless you <laughs> plan on moving. I don't know why. I'm going to show you guys what uh, we have to do with over here. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, it's snowing out. Ooh. Yeah, but look yeah. at that. that. Right there, if you would ask any anyone in the world, they'd say, God's country. That's what they'd say. <laughs> okay, wait. I, 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 I don't know how I got Iowa, but it's Nebraska. So wait. So Have you seen the beach? <laughs> wait, Bro, no, no. I, I want to talk on about vacations. This. I go on vacation. I, I do want to talk about this. Choosing to live in Nebraska versus choosing to live back in Boston or Chicago or even in Southern California. Danny Woodhead is here. Matt Slauson is here. More coming right back. All right, Danny Woodhead and Matt Slauson are both former San Diego Chargers. They both respectively now live in separate locations in the state of Nebraska, not Iowa, Nebraska. Danny, where in Nebraska are you? I'm in Omaha. Okay. And so Matt, how about the, you? The, the, the metropolis. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Matt, how about you? 
I'm about an hour and a half south south of him. Uh, I'm I'm right outside Lincoln, Nebraska. Now, did you guys ever know each other as both guys who kind of grew up in that area as kids? Or you guys are about the same age, high school ball, anything like that? No, I I grew up in Oregon, um, so it was it was in my college experience here that I met my wife, and and then uh, it was our third third year in the league. We decided to put put down roots and we decided Nebraska was going to be the best place for that. I did get to meet, meet Danny once though. It was my junior year, his senior year. Um, he, he, he played his, his game earlier in the day and then he came and watched ours. We were playing Virginia tech at home, prime, prime, prime time ball. And he was able to come, come and watch. So I met, met, met him there and, and then, you know, he he went to the Jets after that, and then I and then I went to the Jets the following year. Uh, so we were teammates there. And then when he was up in New England, we played against each other a bunch. And then he goes to San Diego, I go to Chicago. And then a few years after that, then we were together in San Diego. So, Danny, you you've chosen to live in Nebraska, which is where you're from. Um, right. I know here's what happens with people in San Diego. People in San Diego get to this point where they live here so long. They're like, dude, you can't live anywhere else. I mean, it's the greatest place in the world. You yeah. got the best weather. You know, comparatively speaking, it costs a lot less than L.A. The beaches are insane lifestyle. But interestingly, during COVID, more so than any other time that I can remember, I know more people leaving finally. And the reason is, is because they've learned that they can work from home. They can do it wherever they want. They can live a lot less expensive lifestyle in another part of the country. So people look at guys like yourselves and they go, dude, you made all this money as NFL players. Why would you not stay here? I'm just curious, like life in Nebraska. Um, I mean, it's, it's a whole different world. Tell us about it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely slower pace. It's, it's a little bit more chill. That's what I, I mean, I grew up in a smaller town. I grew up in North Platte, Nebraska, a town of 25,000 people. So not a lot. And the closest, like, major airport was either Denver or Omaha, which is both four hours. So like that, that's a, that's a much slower pace. I Mm -hmm. didn't want to go back to that because I had been in cities for the last 10 years and Omaha and the Metro area is close to a million people. So, I mean, there's definitely things going on and, and you can get the downtown, nice restaurants, whatever you can live outside, outside of like in the suburbs, which is, because it's Nebraska, like I'm not even a mile from a cornfield. So like I'm kind of in the country, but I, I still have the city. So I, I personally love it. Why did I move from San Diego? My, uh, my whole family's here. My wife's family's here. And it's just like, we're, we're big on family, big on family time. We wanted to be close. And we always like, we can go, we can go on vacations when we want to go on vacations. We don't have to, we don't have to live there. Right. The money though, like just the money that whatever, I I don't know if you guys do anything else now in life other than, you know, maybe you made enough money playing football that you'll never have to work again. And God, I hope that's the case for both of you gentlemen, but, but money will go so much further in, in Lincoln, Nebraska or Omaha, Nebraska than it will in San Diego. Oh my gosh. Without a doubt. My, my home here in, uh, here in Nebraska is not twice as big as my, my house that we had in San Diego, but close. And my house in San Diego was more than double in price. So <laughs> sounds I mean, about right. Yeah. So, so it definitely goes further. If, I mean, the thing is I still have friends there. So if I want to, I can just hop on a flight and go hang out, you know, for a few days, whatever, play some golf, come back home. I got my San Diego, uh, fill in and then I, go back to the life that, you know, I want to live. I still love San Diego. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I love San Diego. And, and that's always going to be kind of like a, our second home, like what we see as our second home. But man, you can't beat God's country out here in Nebraska. <laughs> to piggyback off of that, I'm kind of in the same, same boat. I wanted, uh, you know, when you talk about having a family, raising kids, I wanted my, my kids to be in a, and a slow paced atmosphere. And I also wanted to be con- country kids. So, uh, you know, when we bought our place, we started with 20 acres and now we're up to a hundred acres. And, um, you know, we got cows and we got corn and donkeys and all that. And the kids have their chores. And, uh, 
that that would have been out of the question in California there. Now, there's, there's a lot of donkeys here. They're just on the road. <laughs> there's a lot of perks, perks living out there. I mean, nowhere else in the country are you playing playing golf the day after the se- se- season's over. Uh, and, uh, you know, here definitely you see the state – the state of things, things here with all the snow. And I think it was, uh, 16 degrees, 16 degrees today. The wind chill has it at like five. So that's mm. awesome. Um, I have, to get on, <laughs> I have to get on the tractor today and it won't start because all the fuel is fro- fro- frozen in it. So that's awesome. <laughs> so but, here's a, here's a question for you before both of you guys, when yeah. you get to the end of your career and you realize, okay, this is it for me. What's the biggest adjustment? Because I played at a I, I played at a semi high level, never professional. I never made it to the NBA, but I made money playing basketball. But the hardest thing for me to ever accept was that it was over and what was next. And finding what was next was probably the thing that stuck the hardest to me, knowing that you can't go back to that. What what was that like for you guys? It was you know the first I would say the first six months were really hard. Um, I knew, and I even wanted to. I like I chose to be done. Like right. I chose to move on and not play anymore. I think it'd be tougher if I was like kind of kicked out of the league and just said, you can't have a job, you know, like that w- might've been a little bit harder, but I also had a, I mean, for a lot of the people that know me, I'm a very faith-based person and I, it's kind of crazy, but as my, my career was ending, I was kind of like praying about it. Like, Hey God, just show me the time to deuce out, just peace out, you know? And unfortunately it came through, uh, my hamstring injury. And I was like, yeah, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to do this rehab stuff anymore. Not that like I'm scared of injuries, but I was like, I'm over it. I had three major injuries in my career. I'm over it. I I don't, I don't want to do it. And it was almost like, I even was like hoping that the love of the game would be taken away once it was time to go away. Cause most of the people that played with me, I think knew that I was passionate and I loved the game of football. And hopefully fans saw that too, that like my energy, like I loved it, but it came to this time towards the end of, end of like last season in Baltimore, where I was like, man, I, I, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And it kind of t- took the love out of the game. And I, even to the point that I was like, at the end of the year, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore, hon, when I was talking to my wife and I go, you know what? I'm going to do everything I can to prepare for this year. But if I'm not supposed to play, I'm going to pray that the Baltimore Ravens will tr- ask me to restructure. And I'll just say, no, I'll just say, <laughs> I'll just say, unless you give me guaranteed money, no, I'm not restructuring. And what ends up happening free agency? They ask me to restructure. And I said, no. I go, I go, you guarantee, you guarantee, guarantee, me, guarantee the money. me the money. And then I'll restructure a little, but guarantee the money. And then I'm, so it was almost like I had a prayer answered by, by them coming to me and saying, you know, we, we want you to play for less. And after that, I knew that it was done. Like I get really, they, they said, okay, we're going to release you then. And I was like, awesome. And then I kind of got competitive. I was like, you know what? I'm going to sign somewhere else. I'm I'm going to I'm going to sign somewhere else and make them show and hopefully play the Ravens the next year. 2 days go by we're talking we've talked with teams and stuff and I looked at my wife and I was like why what am I chasing? Like so what happened what happens to the contract when you say no to restructuring what does that mean to you financially? Nothing because they released me. I said no oh, I'm so not going to restructure. I, 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 if if they would have had the same contract I would have played it the one that I signed and said I would play, I would have played it all the way out. But if you're going to try to take money away from me, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I know I seen what my body goes through. I'm, 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 I'm not going to play for that amount. And I took that as God saying, all right, you're done. And ended up being, I, I'm, I was so at peace, never missed the game. Still don't miss the game. I love watching it. And I, I felt like it was like a time to move on. And now I put all my passion into to golf and I, I love the game of golf. I try to get, I try to compete in it. Um, and then obviously with the, you know, the pod with slaw, and then I'm a, a partner in a consulting company called performance mountain, which slaw is now a part of too, um, where we consult businesses and sports teams and like, man, I get my competitive feel in all of that. Yeah, and it's been, that's it's really been, cool. It's been an amazing thing to where like, 
there's nothing about football I miss oh, because wow. because golf, golf, the people I play with, that's my locker room. You know, like I, uh, in in freaking just on the pod with Slaw, that's more than a locker room. Mm-hmm. How'd that start? Why podcasting? I'm always curious when former I, athletes. I love yes. it. Yeah, I, so I, I love when athletes do it. I think I think most more guys should do it. I know everybody has a podcast, but why did you guys start doing it? You know, I I hated the media when I was in New England. And Welcome then to I the kinda, club. You the yeah, media yeah, now, yeah. baby. I know, isn't it crazy? And then I get to uh, San Diego, and I started to warm up to it because I at first I didn't know how to answer questions because I was like, oh, I can have an opinion, you know. Whereas in New England, it's almost like you're known. Don't have an opinion. So we, we get there and I'm like, I kind of like it. It's fun. I do a show with, I did a show every 20 minutes with, uh, Ormberger on his show and, and Mark Willard. And I was like, you know what? This is kind of fun. And, and I kind of just threw it around. Um, once I got done, I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll just start a podcast. So I kind of slaw was about to retire and I said something to him. I was like, Hey, yeah, let's just podcast. You know, that'll be fun. Kind of jokingly, kind of serious. He did, I didn't think he was for sure about it. So I was like, you know what, this last year and what was it in February? I was like, you know what? I'm going to start a podcast. I'm going to do it. If Slotta wants to do it, awesome. If not, no big deal. Well, I didn't feel like he was fully on board yet. He didn't really know. And I didn't know. So guess what I did? Slaw was my first guest. (laughs) So like our first episode was actually me interviewing Slaw. And then after, when we got done, we kind of looked at each other like, that was kind of fun. You just want to do it? And he's like, yeah, sure. And that's, that's literally how it started. Wouldn't you agree, Slaw? Yeah. Yeah, it was all, it was all his idea uh, to kind of go back to what he was saying about his journey to retire. I had kind of a similar one, uh, but also a little, a little different. I also got, got hurt in my final year playing. I uh, broke my neck and my back. And, uh, and after the season was over, the GM called me into his office and said, Look, I know I know you don't want to hang it up. So so we have received calls from other teams, and uh, and they want you to come and play. But they're all out on the east east coast. And I looked at him. I said, "Nope, I ain't doing it." And he said, "All right. Well, I can't send you back out on the field to play here because with your injury, I have to answer to your wife if you go out there and get hurt again. So I'm not going to do it. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll make you a coach. And I was like, holy crap. So I'm talking to my wife. I'm like, I, I think we got to got a coach. But it was kind of in that process that I realized that I didn't want to play anymore because now the coaching opportunity started to become a thing. And, uh, and, and that kind of showed me like, okay, I'm ready to be done playing. And then, and then I started diving a little, a little deeper, like, man, if the prospect of coaching showed me I didn't want to play, it's probably a good idea that I step away from the game right, right, right now. And instantly Woodhead called and was like, yes, let's start a podcast. Let's do it. Let, let, let's go. It's going to be fun. And I knew and- he didn't want to coach because that would suck. Coaching you sucks. Know, yeah. Let me tell you something. Coaching's the worst. It sounds great when you're a head coach and you're making seven or eight million dollars a year, but when you're an entry level coach, you know, and you're cutting tape and you're and you're writing up game plans for guys that you know that you're smarter than, okay, and then you're grinding your way, position coach, position coach, different organizations, going to you know recruit like I say recruiting, but like scouting trips to bowl games and and just and breaking down film of college players and. It takes forever, dude. My college roommate, we're both 50. My college roommate has been an assistant coach in the NFL for 20 years. Okay, had a 10 or 12 year playing career, did a broadcast job with the Buffalo Bills for like two or three years thereafter, and then has been grinding his way through NFL Europe, through um, any any place he could. And is finally, finally, he's the offensive coordinator of the Cleveland Browns, and he's still not calling plays, right? So he's making close to a million bucks a year, but he's not calling plays yet. So you know, to get to the head coaching level, like if you were Mike McCoy, Danny, you, you, that was a lucky break, man. At, at the right time, you had yeah. Peyton Manning, and you became the hot guy. Yeah, and it and it and then it's awesome. But like, man, like I know the hours they put in, and I know the amount of hours they get to see their children. Man, I have four kids. I if if I were to ever coach, it would be like, and I I'm not gonna like I, but I'm saying like it would have to be later on because. 
I want to, I want to, I want to be a part of my, my kids' lives. And, and then guess what? You know, if, if I can be blessed with my kids end up having kids and I'm a grandpa, I want to spend time with my grandkids Mm -hmm. Uh, instead of putting in those hours. I, guys, I love the game of football more than anything, you know, outside of my faith and my, my family. Like it was a blast. It was where I could put, I'm a very competitive person and it's where I could just obviously put those competitive juices is playing the game. I, I love the game so much, but I can't even imagine not being able to go home at nights, having to sleep in the office. Like, Mm -hmm. That's not cool. No, it's not cool. Not, not. Hey, Danny, have you guys, um, just as we get ready to wrap things up, yeah. have you paid attention at all or have you seen any pictures on Facebook or any videos of how Qualcomm Stadium is being destroyed? And, and the thing is, I realize you didn't play your entire career in mm-hmm. San Diego. And Matt, same. You didn't play your entire career. It was a stop along the way. Mm-hmm. But, Danny, you said it was like the greatest time of your life. And you played for the New England Patriots. And you right. – played in the Super Bowl for the Patriots. And yep. you probably can text Tom Brady today. I mean, my point is, is that you loved your time in San Diego. The team's gone. The LA Times today called them a laughing stock. And we talked about that earlier. But the it stadium's being torn to shreds, dude. You got to see how they're doing it. And I don't know if there's any emotional thing for you. Like for me, people went and bought seats. I was like, I'm not buying seats. Forget that. I, yeah. I kind of want to forget about it. But then I, I honestly, I see what they're doing to it. And there is something emotional that's happening inside every time I see this yeah. thing being torn to shreds. How about for you guys? I, I, I haven't seen it yet. Um, and because I played on four teams, I'm not super emotional about any of that, I will say when we did move from San Diego, it was a little bit sad because that was our, where our fam, our small little family at the time was kind of, that's where we grew. And, and that's where my, my oldest really grew up. And then I had two more born there. Um, so like, yeah, it, it sucked because that was four years and, and we loved it. We made friends outside of football. We made obviously friends in football. Um, so that's tough, but I, I can see, it even more affecting you guys because it's like, man, the Chargers have been there forever. And yes, they moved to LA, but the taking down of the stadium is like permanent. You're like, holy crap. Yeah. Like we're actually, we're actually done. done. Like it's, yeah, there, it's over. There's always oh been a part God. of me that's, uh, uh, oh my goodness. Yeah, we're showing it to, to, to Matt and Danny right now. For those of you that are listening on radio, we're actually showing Matt and Danny on a, on a Zoom call right now. We're showing them the destruction of Qualcomm Stadium. Can you guys believe this? I mean, just take a look at this. These yeah. are aerial shots, yeah. Man, I'll tell you what, I had some good times at that place, though. Um, even though we, we sucked a couple of the years, <laughs> like I had a lot of good times there. I, I shoot, see the 15 there. I don't know how many times I drove, drove the 15. I mean... San Diego's when I, when I say that's like a second home, that's like a second home. We, since we've retired every year, we make it a point to go out there for a week and just rent a home because that's, that's our second home. That really was our, where we would consider, we loved, I mean, I don't know if we loved every single place we played in the NFL, but that was the place where we like, we loved. And that's where, I mean, my kids grew up every Saturday. We went to the beach after we would go to breakfast at Claire's on Cedros in Solana Beach or the Dude, Naked Right around Cafe. the corner from my house, right here. Yeah. Right around the corner from where I'm broadcast. Yes, yes. So like that's like that was our that was like our home. Like even though we lived a little bit more inland, we lived in the in Rancho Bernardo. We would always go every Saturday. We'd go to or Tuesdays during the during the season when we had our day off. It was Claire's on Cedros or it was Naked Cafe, and then you have. Um, all the stuff up there in uh, Encinitas where whenever we come back and even during during the year, where was the spots that we went? We went to the fish shop. We went to Best of Juan's Pizza like in Cardiff. All like, the time. I mean, I mean, there's so my places. Many, yeah, yeah, it's it's the best. It's that that was our that was our spots. And um, so, like, is there a, is there some emotions in San Diego for me? Without a doubt. So but I will say this. The stadium, not as much for me. The the city, much more for me. How about you, Matt? Any any feelings of seeing a stadium getting torn down like that that you played in? Well, I, I mean, look, I was part of the chart Chargers late in my career, so um, I I I played two years for that organization, one in San Diego, one in L.A. So my emotional attachment there is a lot less, but it's still part of football history when you look at. Um, 
you know, even, even though, you know, my opinion of the chart, chart chargers right now aren't extremely high, they're still part of the NFL. And there's a, a lot of his history going through that organization. So when you see a place like that, that has been home, home to the team for so incredibly long. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a punch in the gut to watch, watch that video there. It's really I know, sad. I know. Like for me personally, like I got to San Diego in 2001, I think to myself, how many NFL games I broadcast on radio, on TV, how many times I hosted tailgate parties there, built my radio career all on that team's back and on in, in that stadium. So yeah, it's a little it's kind of strange emotion. Hey, real quick before you guys go, cause I actually would like to do this again. Yeah. Um, how often do you guys put out the out of nowhere podcast? Uh, we, depending on the week, I mean, it's because of football right now, we're doing about three a week because anyone that's in Nebraska, Matt played at Nebraska. We're in Nebraska. We always break down the Nebraska football game. That's oh, I have a Nebraska question, but I, uh, we don't have time. Yeah, we, oh. we, no, we get, we, yeah, I know you do. It's, yeah. it's the most amazing state ever, but, uh, <laughs> oh. we, and then we also, we break down NFL games, um, just because we're finding out people actually weirdly care what we think about football. Uh, we, we don't think we're anything special, but I guess they like our analysis of what's going on in the NFL. And then uh, every uh, it's either Thursday or Friday, depending on the week. Um, we will also come out with just uh, what's going on in the world type stuff because man, we just, or it's either that or we have an interview because we have been blessed to meet a lot of people that actually will come on our show. So we just have a lot of fun. It's, it's literally out of nowhere. Uh, stories are out of nowhere. Our conversations are freaking crazy, but uh, we have a lot of fun. Dude, I, I will be in touch. I got to say, we got to have you guys back again. Hopefully we yeah. can do it again really, really soon. Uh, Danny, a pleasure. Matt, great talking to you. Great to see you guys. Glad your families, families are, healthy are healthy and well. And, well. and you guys, and life's treating you good, man. Thank you guys. Hey, th hey thanks for having us. If you ever want to live, you know, an actual life, awesome life. When, if, as long as COVID doesn't mess it up, you got to come out in the summer for the college world series. If you like base, baseball at all, it's like I, the always coolest time in Omaha. I've got no, a friend I can't, I can't wait there. To, to, to smash Nebraska football. Next time we talk. Hey, uh, <laughs> bro, you know they're, what? You, they're, like you, a, they're, they're a heaping f dumpster fire right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame, but my friend Kurt Warner's son plays there, man. I, know. I, I, I root for them. No, I, we, we both, he played there. So he obviously roots for him. I root for him, even though they said I sucked and wasn't good enough to play football there, but you know, I've, <laughs> no, I've, 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 I've worked on, I've forgiveness, worked on forgiveness. So <laughs> uh, trust me at the moment, right, right now, we are taking our turn smashing Nebraska football. We are. It, is, it is just, Oh my gosh. It is awful over here. Right. Yeah. right now in terms of football, listen to our pod tomorrow morning. If you want to, you want to hear our actual takes on it. All right, the Out of Nowhere podcast. Danny Woodhead, Matt Slauson. Great to be with both of you guys. Uh, stay healthy, stay out, healthy there. out there. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.